Barnsley Council's nuclear bomb-proof shelter has been closed after being destroyed by vandals. <laughs> the scaffolder was unaware that he'd shot himself in the head with a rivet gun until he went to the canteen and found he couldn't take his hard hat off. <laughs> Owing to drought and shortage of water, we have closed three lanes of the swimming pool. <laughs> Everybody talks about the news. Not all the talk is serious. Over a drink, over tea, we laugh, we muse, we gasp, giggle, gossip, and the chat is irreverent, quirky. <laughs> And that's what the news quiz has essentially been about. When it started in 1977, we'd come through the 60s, so irreverence was nothing new. Ned Sherin was already running a news-based quiz of the week on TV. A young producer working in BBC Light Entertainment, John Lloyd, was asked to come up with a radio version. Everybody reads a paper, even if it's only The Sun, and everybody likes a good quotation, everybody likes a laugh. I've since thought the job of a producer or director, though it doesn't seem like this, is to get out of the way. You simply need to allow the people to, to be who they can be. We present the news quiz, and here's the chairman, Barry Norman. When it was launched with Barry Norman in the chair, the news quiz was very Grub Street, a forum for hacks, mostly unknown, regular team captains with a changing cast of guest players vying with one another to see who knew most about the week's news. There was even an unwritten rule that only journalists would be allowed on the panel. Danny Greenstone worked on the early programmes with John Lloyd. We had the rule because it would be too simple to simply populate the show with comedians. There were too many good ones around and we wanted the news quiz to be very different and to stand out from yet another radio show that was an excuse to bring comedians to the microphone. Um, there are a lot of those. There are a lot of those still, and they're all great shows, but the news quiz was forging a style of programme that hadn't been heard for a long time. Well, now, let me introduce this week's panel, who are Alan Corran, the editor of Punch, Richard Ingram's editor of Private Eye, Clement Freud, MP, and the newscaster and broadcaster, Angela Rippon. And to make it different, to make certain that you listen and that you enjoy it and we have informed people on, we're not going to go and book a selection of comics who will twist the news story to provide themselves a feed for the gag that they want to do. And right from the beginning, there was quite a lot of flack from the department of, you know, who are these guys? If you can imagine it, people like Richard Ingrams and Alan Corran had barely broadcast. So they were not well-known names in the way that Nicholas Parsons was or, you know, Clement Freud or Kenneth Williams or whatever. And they weren't seen to be Ellie-type guys. And it looked like I'd gone completely the wrong way. But it was one of those shows, I think it may in fact be the only show, the only pilot I've ever made that right from the beginning looked like an, an amazing winner. And I'd, uh, I'd just like to leave you with this cutting from Monday's Daily Express. It was talking about how reporters had met Bjorn Borg and his fiancée at London Airport at midday on Sunday, and it said, and I quote, At the airport there were the inevitable questions about marriage. Don't talk about it now. I only got out of bed an hour ago, he said. Now I want to get home for a good night's sleep. <laughs> Goodbye. A combination of good casting and simplicity of format was obviously at the core. But there was perhaps something else. The programme started strong and confident and attracted its own momentum. Listeners tuned in expecting to laugh. Panellists turned up expecting it to be fun. It shot off like a rocket. It was getting a million listeners within three weeks. As the weeks went by and the programme was established, it became a public duel for the two team captains, the editors of both major humorous magazines of the era, Punch and Private Eye. Here's Danny Greenstone again. It was actually like buying the entire programme in one fell swoop. With Private Eye, we got Richard Ingrams uh, as editor. With Punch, of course, we got Alan Corran. And they established themselves very, very quickly and very firmly in the public consciousness too, as, the, as it were the bookends of the programme. But what with Richard Ingrams on one side from Private Eye and me on the other from Punch... And I used to I used to have a say. We all had a say in who we wanted with us. And Richard would get in. Well, his slot was too young. His slot was still on the tit. Um, 
Richard had people like John Wells, Peter Cook, you know, smashing private eye people. Uh, and I would have uh, friends of mine from Punch, who were uh, often women people like uh, Anne Leslie, Joan Bakewell, Catherine Whitehorn. So it sort of fell into two sorts of people, the public school language side on the one, uh, and ours, who were the pushy uh, new uh, grammar school generation trying to destroy the others. And that gave it, it, gave it a sort of edge. Punch had been going since the 19th century. Private Eye had been started in the 60s and was regarded as young, fashionable, more racy and more risky. Paradoxically, the two editors showed the contrary traits to their magazines. Punch had been given to Alan Corran, dynamic, hard-working, Jewish, to zap up its rather fusty image, whereas Private Eye had been started by languid, louche, English establishment, public school types. In Alan Corran and Richard Ingram's, the news quiz found two radio naturals who were perfect foils for one another. Ingram's as the laid-back toff from Private Eye, who claimed to be immune to popular culture and never knew any of the answers, pitted against the fiercely competitive, sharp-as-a-razor humour of the ever-so-slightly chippy Alan Corran. Richard Ingram's. There was always a kind of punch-Private Eye rivalry because Private Eye, in a way, had been started as an antidote to punch in the... 60s. You know, the, the old joke about Punch was that it was what you saw in the dentist's waiting room. However much they said, well, actually, it isn't there anymore, and dentists don't have waiting rooms anymore. That was the, the image that it had, and it was a very difficult one for people like Alan to, to reverse that. By the time we arrive at the news quiz, the two roles had been set down that Private Eye would be a scurrilous, investigative, run the line close to liable, and ours would be young but light-hearted, so that Punch was very... I mean, Punch was a very commercially successful magazine. Private Eye wasn't. Private Eye was done on sugar paper, the way it is now. Didn't have advertisements, but it ran at a profit because it had very high cover sales. We had lower cover sales, but we had uh, that sort of niche marketing of the rich that meant we had a lot of advertising. Punch was unquestionably more suburban, nothing wrong with that. Private Eye was uh, more Soho. I mean, in a way, Private Eye was a sort of naughty schoolboy, and Punch was uh, the old uh, dad sitting in his club. And yet, in radio terms, in broadcasting terms, when you put Richard Ingrams and Alan Corran up against each other, what you actually got was the editor of the jolly, comfortable gentleman's club magazine, Punch, being the more vicious, uh, in a funny way, of course, uh, of the two contributors, and Richard Ingrams, uh, who made an absolute virtue out of claiming to not have read the newspapers that week and not know any news and being very light and fluffy. Richard, why is Thomas Williams likely to be thirsty everywhere but Portsmouth? Ah, I mean, I'm very glad I'm going to maintain my, my score of naught. <laughs> <laughs> Following this round. Well, Clement Freud. I don't know who this man Williams is. My own attitude was, uh, which is always has been actually, to everything, uh, that of an amateur who doesn't sort of try very hard. The greater truth is that Richard Ingram's played it entirely to his advantage. Uh, I think he grabbed what he had in his head with both hands and expanded it into a character. Richard Ingram's, your music. <laughs> You play these awful pop records. Uh, I never knew what any of them were, and I've never made any effort to know what they, what they were. Well, as you obviously recognise, Richard, that is the signature tune of Pot Black. <laughs> so, if that music be the food of love, for whom should it play on? Well, I, I was, I was going to say it was Mrs. Thatcher playing the piano, uh, and the news that uh, she was going to be friends again with Edward Heath. Or Edward Heath, but it, it, it isn't that. No, she doesn't yeah. play, no. She doesn't play no. the piano, but she... No, well, not in Pot Black, she, she did, doesn't. I feel that that's how she would play. <laughs> <laughs> would anybody else like to uh, suggest? Come along, Alan. But, I mean, that was absolutely no affectation on my part. I still don't know anything about uh, any of these people. And I don't intend to find out. He liked the idea of being an old man. Harry Thompson is Ingram's biographer and produced the news quiz from the mid-80s. 
I mean, he did seem like an old man to me at the time. This would be in the mid-80s. But if I work it out now, he was actually in his mid-40s. So he's about five years older than I am now. And, and he was just doing this pensioner act. And part of it involved pretending not to know anything about popular culture. Richard, who was delivered from the sack by a delivery from the sack? I don't know at all. <laughs> <laughs> Department of No Any Surprise. Clues going? Well, I don't really think I can offer you many clues, except it's about postmen, because Alan Corrin knows. When he's doing this deliberately, he wants to throw it. No, he doesn't. I'm going to be a party to England's coming up smiling as a non-swat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the hell? Why act against on, type? Give us a clue, um, then. Simmering under the surface of the two men's jousts was Corrin's fury that Ingram's was making a devil-may-care virtue out of not bothering. Corrin bothered a lot. The more Ingram's thrashed about in blissful ignorance, the more competitive Corrin became. Among the hundreds of panellists who popped in occasionally, Corrin is a constant, the only one who stayed with the programme from the start. And this will to win on the part of Alan Corrin has been a thread running through the programme's history. Danny Greenstone. A very, very strong part of that personality was almost what you would find in every traditional stand-up comedian from, from vaudeville days onward or music hall days onward. Alan had the greatest gift to create a joke from very, very poor material. Either he'd relate it to his own personal life or he would have found somewhere a wonderful thought that actually connected the story with a, a gag. Who used one of his nine to get back to Ted? <laughs> I don't have the faintest idea. <laughs> Time was on this programme, I got all the animal questions. Now I get all the John Major questions, because all the John Major questions are animal questions. This is the same as a goldfish one. A couple of weeks ago, there was John Major putting KY jelly on a goldfish for some reason. <laughs> and his cat heard about this. And the cat said, I'm not staying with people like this. And it <laughs> threw a few things into a suitcase and cleared off. <laughs> And according to the Times, which is my newspaper and, and, and a newspaper of record, uh, the cat died. Uh, the next day, the Times was proved to have been slightly premature because the cat wasn't dead at all. It had turned up at somebody else's place with its suitcase, hung its hat up and, uh, and tucked in. And the fact is that the Majors, food is not very good. There's something wrong with this cat's kidney. It's called Humphrey. And its kidneys are a bit dodgy, so they put it on a low-protein diet rather than the Helmut Kohl diet. The cat heard about Helmut Kohl and probably turned up at the German Embassy. <laughs> And like one of those knackwurst, please, with a, with a genetically engineered tomato on the side. Because they won't let me eat the goldfish because he's covered them in Vaseline. <laughs> uh, the, the, and the people, the people seeing the picture of this cat in the Times, it looks like four million cats. I do not believe it's the same cat, but it's a, it's a, it's a black and white cat. And they've given it back to Major, you'll believe anything. <laughs> He always wanted to win the news quiz. He always wanted to, to make, to get the most points. And he did, I knew, I, I know perfectly well that he made terrific preparations beforehand. That's absolutely true. I mean, as a piece of shorthand, I was fiercely competitive. Um, I didn't like Ingram's enormously. I, th I thought Ingram's was actually pompous. I would sometimes deliberately let him win because I knew that then he would be, he would be much more uh, relaxed and funny uh, if he knew that he was ahead was my team never seemed to worry too much about whether we were losing. So congratulations to Alan Corran, who is our winner and wins Richard Ingrams outright. And uh, <laughs> congratulations to Richard Ingrams, who has now set up a completely unbeatable world all-comers record on this programme by recording a totally blank score. A big hand for Richard Ingrams, please. I, I am competitive because I grew up as... Um, <laughs> part of a pony show, really. It was, was dog and pony. It was rosettes and prizes. It's the only way you could get on. I'm, I'm a counter-jumper. Uh, England was born with a silver dick in his mouth. I, I think of it. I don't dislike him that much, but he had everything. He did have everything. I mean, his father was immensely rich, hugely rich family, um, really crappy public schools and uh, layabouts at Oxford. Um, <laughs> Ingrams knew how to put a man down. I've never seen anyone wear a jacket like that before, not even, not even Alan Corrin. Do you remember, do you remember that nice jacket he wore? Yes, awfully, but I like the jacket in yeah. Richard adheres to very rigorous lines of what is and isn't right. I'm actually much more flexible. 
and much more lovable and funnier and with much more charm and so much younger. The news quiz established itself as part of the furniture at Radio 4. Class warfare was never far from the surface, not the workers' struggle against capitalists, but a sniping war between middle-class meritocrats and as-of-right public schoolboys. Their culture was very clearly an upper-middle-class culture, and ours wasn't. Uh, and that was reflected on Richard's side. Richard was happiest when he had uh, around him people who were like him. What crisis was crowned by a right Charlie? It's this week's royal book. There's a new one every week now. And um, the latest one is Charles's uh, apology for himself, which is to say that really it's everyone else's fault, and particularly his father, who was such a ghastly man. And, um, yeah, I, think, I think he's been tremendously brave. He has. To reveal that um, <laughs> he has met Jonathan Dimbleby. in person and uh, talk to him for a while. Really. I, I want to read the memoirs of all these blokes who knocked him about at Gordonston. Apparently they were all lining up. To hang one on him. I can't, I, it seems amazing. But, but, but apparently they all do. They're all grown men now out there. There are all these blokes who've um, had a go at Charles with knotted towels and grabbed him here and there. And they said things like, you've got, you, with ears like that, you'll never be king, didn't they? Unkind Bloody good like school, that. isn't it? It's clever, clever school. <laughs> clever, well, clever we all, swine, we all had they? that, didn't we, Peter? We didn't go white. I was it? told I'd never be king. <laughs> <laughs> Very early on. And I didn't go white into the press, no. no. Of, course <laughs> <you didn't. laughs> of course I didn't. You took it like a man. I took it, uh, I took it like a hermaphrodite, which I... <laughs> I was told I was. <laughs> but whatever I did, I took it. You were doing Today, perhaps only Boris Johnson persists as a reminder of a world of post-60s comedy in which a still-privileged generation joshed and jackassed about, poking fun at their own class for the amusement of the masses, but never quite forgetting their status. These undercurrents beneath a changing sea are subtly captured in the News Quiz archive. Richard Ingrams, John Wells and Peter Cook, inheritors of the tradition of Beachcomber and Malcolm Muggeridge, seemed to represent the forces of insubordination, but were all tangled up with privilege. John uh, Wells or Peter Cook were probably even worse than I was about knowing the answers, because I, I used to, because I was editor of private, I used to have to read a lot of newspapers, so on the, I, 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 knew, I knew a little bit more than them. Uh, but they were both brilliant at, at uh, going off onto sort of wild flights of fancy. I remember Wells doing some ludicrous thing about these gay octopuses which had uh, attacked the Tory party conference at Bournemouth. Um, it had nothing to do with anything at all, I don't think. There we are, you see, I knew about that. I read about it in gay news. Are they still published? <laughs> <laughs> Is it off the coast at Bournemouth, these gay octopuses? Are they? <laughs> you wonder what all the security is for after the IRA have gone. To keep gay octopuses from uh, upsetting the grabbing cannon. hold of Lady Thatcher. Oh, indeed. <laughs> or Mr. Portillo. That yes. would be very sad. <laughs> if a huge, enormous gay octopus suddenly rose from the waves, <laughs> entangling one of its tentacles around his leg and dragged him giggling into the water. <laughs> <laughs> that, that isn't the answer. <laughs> yes, it is. That'll do me. <laughs> Craziness like that does not just happen. Cook, Wells, Corran and Ingrams depended, more than was always apparent, on the skill of the chairman, Harry Thompson, who produced the quiz in the 1980s. You have to be in charge, i.e. you have to know when to rein people in. You also have to know when to let them ramble on. It's a very difficult area of judgement. You have to be able to be rude while not alienating them, while staying friends. It's, you have to be able to do one-liners and do them cold and do them flat. You have to be able to know when the thing's flagging and when to come in with a joke. It's an incredibly difficult job. After Barry Norman, Barry Took and a young Simon Hoggart took turns at spells in the chair. On and off, Barry Took was in the chair for over 15 years. Took had BBC Light Entertainment running in his blood. He died earlier this year. As Ian Hislop wrote... For once his timing let him down. He managed to die in the same week as the Queen Mother, eclipsing the obituaries he deserved about his tour de force of a career in broadcasting. A tremendous list of credits from Educating Archie and Round the Horn to the Army Game and Bootsy and Snudge. 
He was also the midwife to Monty Python, Ian Hislop. He was basically showbiz. Um, he was comedy. So he had all these sort of sharp journalists and sort of um, broadcasters and comics in print. But Barry could do it live. So if there was a live audience um, there, Barry would make them laugh. He could deliver a script fine, but he could actually do the stand-up thing. So if you had some slightly stiff journalists just wondering how to fill in the silences, there would be Barry and he would cover it. Martin, your question now. What's the latest word on the search for the lost ball? No, my, my colleague would like no, to tell, tell you more Alan. detail Tell us, on Alan. This. You'll get all the points. There's a man called, I think, Mr Besh, who's tired of losing his golf ball. So he's got a golf ball that talks to the hole. He gets up in the morning and down the 18 holes of his golf course, he puts a little transponder and it talks to his ball. And when he hits the ball and it doesn't turn up, he goes to the hole and puts his ear to it and it says, it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> talking golf ball, I mean, I think Welshmen are barking mad, try golfers. <laughs> this man talks to his ball. It's the latest British development in golf technology, balls that talk. <laughs> yes, I'm on a tightrope here, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes, we lead the world when it comes to talking golf technology. <laughs> the ball's development hasn't been without problems. <laughs> recently, <laughs> recently one was activated whilst in the trouser pocket. <laughs> of a golfer relaxing in the clubhouse. The resultant message of, I'm in here. <laughs> caused the lady captain to faint. Simon Hoggart came back in 1996 to take over from Took. Not only had he chaired before, but had himself been a panelist under Barry's chairmanship. He came from a fantastic comic tradition. Barry was had played the Glasgow Empire on a wet Saturday afternoon, which is allegedly the hardest thing you could ever do. Uh, Barry had written Round the Horn, I think the funniest series the BBC have ever put on, which is actually just as funny now. But unlike many comedians, he was extremely generous with his laughter. And, you know, a lot of comedians, if they hear someone else getting laughs, would attempt to damp it down, to move on, to cap it, to do whatever, to, to beat it. Barry never did. If he thought you were worth encouraging. By golly, he encouraged you. <laughs> it's all about Dorothy O'Grady, the Isle of Wight landlady, who apparently spied for Germany from her Sandown guest house. Mrs O'Grady played the part of an eccentric rather than a spy. When arrested by soldiers in 1940, she said, I suppose they got the idea I was a spy because I was wearing a little swastika flag on my coat. <laughs> we don't know what the training courses the Germans sent her on, but camouflage obviously wasn't one of them. <laughs> The authorities found her hotel full of detailed plans of beach defences of the Isle of Wight, together with a booking on the car ferry to Portsmouth for a party of 27 panzer divisions. <laughs> they also intercepted a Morse code message telling the Germans only to invade between 7 and 8 if they wanted a hot bath. Keeping up the pace as a comedy series for quarter of a century, the news quiz has been more than a Radio 4 treasure. It's been the launch of soaring careers for producers who took not only their own talents over to television, but the archetype, the concept, of a certain kind of entertainment founded on a news-based competition. After starting the news quiz, John Lloyd went on to make Not the Nine O'Clock News, Spitting Image and Blackadder. With the next wave of bright young Oxbridge graduates came Harry Thompson, who had his own ideas about comedy. <laughs> In 1990, Thompson was asked to produce a television version of the news quiz. Basically, Have I Got News For You, which has been a very influential TV show, was a straight steal from the news quiz. I mean, it was meant to be the t televised version. Um, and, and that's why I left the news quiz to make that with his lot. We left uh, Ingrams and Corrin and took behind. And it's basically the same show, and they think it's all over. It's basically the same show, and never mind the Buzzcocks, it's basically the same show. And it did spawn um, a genre of comedy quizzes. I'd like to think that's because uh, it was such a tremendously innovative and exciting way to deal with um, you know, topics. But actually, the real reason it's done so well is it's incredibly cheap TV. 
because you can have comedians on a small flat fee. They don't have to write jokes. They don't have to learn lines. They just come along and be spontaneously funny and the whole thing costs half what a sitcom would. I've been a panellist on both the news quiz and Have I Got News For You. It's like the difference between being a free-range and a battery chicken. There are similarities. Both are a bit of a soap opera or panto with familiar characters acting familiar stereotypes on familiar themes. But on the news quiz, though the chairman has a few prepared jokes, it really isn't fixed, and the show they broadcast is pretty much what the studio audience has watched. On Have I Got News For You, it's much more rigged and edited, and the whole thing hangs on the character stereotyping. Alan Corrin. The chairman on the news quiz, whether it's Barry Norman or Russell Davis or Barry Took or, or now Simon Hoggart, they withdraw from it. They are genuine chairman. Angus Deaton wants to be, and often is, funnier than the people. And what they have done, really, with Have I Got News For You, which we didn't do with the news quiz, is create a situation comedy where Merton has a role of the thickier musical tradition Max Miller figure. Hislop has a role as the waspish private eye figure. And in the middle there is the coke-snorting, shagging, modern, sophisticate Angus Deaton. So they have three roles, and they shout, you know, they argue with one another. Merton will ask personal questions about Deaton's life, though most of those are now answered by the tabloids. Um, and they talk about one another's suits, clothes, habits, women, and all that. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a show with um, three actors in it. News quiz isn't like that. It wasn't ever a sitcom. Nobody had assigned roles. Willy-nilly, certain persona were thrust upon us because Richard was the way Richard is. And because the way I am the way I am, I became more the way I am and Richard became more the way he was to sort of differentiate ourselves. John Lloyd, who was originally going to present Have I Got News For You, sees big differences in the tone of the programmes. There's a very, well, I'd say rather a daring edge to Have I Got News For You that I don't think is really in the brief of, of the news quiz. I think the news quiz is a much more... Uh, it's warmer, I think. It's more likeable. It, it's more... In the case of sort of Jeremy and, and Andy, um, Linda Smith, it's kind of, it's a kind of slightly, you know, askance despair that, you know, this is look what they've done now. Whereas, you know, his lot particularly can put the knife in, can't he, where he said, this, my God, this bloke really means it. It is one of the uh, rare programmes on television where you can get a bit of satire in. I mean, it's not entirely satirical and there are lots of other things going on. And sometimes I think it's a bit of a sitcom, really. But, uh, yes, there are opportunities to make points. I mean, much as there are on the radio, and that's always been its strength. Danny Greenstone. I can't think of many places around the globe where journalists would be given the freedom or allowed to say on radio or any media what we had our bunch saying on the news quiz. I think that's one of the great things that the radio news quiz has done is, is show that... Um, journalists can actually broadcast well. I had a few close encounters with Lady Thatcher this week, but every time I met her, she seemed to be more on transmit than receive. <laughs> <laughs> well, you famous, I mean, you were instrumental in her downfall. Yes, no, we had an encounter some years ago, and she's you never really forgiven me, it's true. Does she ever if I hadn't her? been there, she'd still be Prime Minister. I know, you I said, <laughs> I, we all saw it. He said... He said, Prime Minister, here's the microphone. I, do you remember? And, and, and she was just about to say something to rally her, her troops. I resign. <laughs> he said, Prime Minister, the microphone's over here. And that was it. It was a difficult question, obviously. She thought it was a question. It was a statement. I, you know, that was a... That was a Does she, do you ever talk about it when you two get together? We do. We sit very around the fire in the evenings discussing it all, reminiscing, you know, remember Paris, and I laugh, and she laughs. <laughs> John Sargent and Boris Johnson. Every Western democracy allows some journalists to make fun of politicians. But Britain is unusual. Serious mainstream political journalists are valued also for their wit and satire, and politicians are allowed to make jokes as well as be the joke. Maybe it's because we're blessed with a parliamentary system that encourages quick-wittedness, rudeness and balloon-pricking. Richard Ingram's. Americans, uh, and I did have a few American friends who came to see the news quiz, 
they found it very, very puzzling that, that this kind of thing could go on. They couldn't imagine it in America. Roy Hattersley is one of a band of politicians who've combined a career in the House, both houses now, with journalism. He was a regular on the news quiz right from the early days. Uh, if you listen to Senate debates, which have a certain formality, a uh, slightly different formality from that in Westminster, but a formality nevertheless, I've never heard a joke of any sort made in the Senate. Uh, or in the House of Representatives. I guess there must have been jokes in both of those great institutions, but never one when I've been in the gallery. And what you'll hear from American politicians is, first of all, their admiration for the verbal facility of English politicians. They can't believe things like Prime Minister's Question Time. And having said how amazed they are that prime ministers of every party can answer questions apparently unscripted, they then go on to express equal amazement that they're prepared to make jokes. Roy. Well, mine's from a magazine which shall be nameless till the end of the quotation. The quotation goes, extraordinary powers can prove inconvenient at times. I was in Sainsbury's once when I had a sudden vision near the avocados. It gave me quite a turn, and I knew immediately that something was wrong. Sure enough, when I got home, I found that my pet hamster had escaped from his cage and had been sucked into the hoover. <laughs> That's from the Accountant magazine. <laughs> Another regular on the news quiz and its TV spin-off has been the politician who's now become leader of the Lib Dems, Charles Kennedy or the Honourable Member for Have I Got News For You, as he's sometimes known. The Hull News, towards the end of last year, ran a little piece saying dog owners be warned. Hull City Council's dog warden service is stepping up its campaign against stray dogs. If dogs carry identification, they may be returned home free of charge. <laughs> but owners of unidentifiable dogs will be charged a fee. <laughs> There is a tradition in British politics where wit actually matters. And if you think about many of the famous statements that politicians down the ages have made, a lot of them have got humour content to them as well as making a political point. And I think it's just very much in that kind of British idiom as a programme, which is why it works for journalists and politicians alike, as well as, obviously, for the listeners. The Americans do it rather differently from us. They on the whole, regard the news as being sacrosanct. It's something you have to take terribly seriously, be entirely accurate about, um, something you really shouldn't trivialise at all. But that's if you're a journalist. Humour is, as it were, cordoned off, put in its own paddock where it exists on its own. So um, humour columns in newspapers say on top, humour. Simon Hoggart. Bringing humour into the centre of serious politics favours those politicians, and only those, who have a talent for it. If a politician comes on and does well, I think it's hugely valuable to them. I mean, Charles Kennedy's been on a lot, and he says, you know, essentially it's two years opening fates or one appearance. I mean, his constituents like him a lot more after they've seen him on that. So, yes, it is worth it for them, if they can hack it. Jeremy, which despot's appointment was a disappointment to potheads? Oh, um... Now, this is really a question for Charles, because he's a liberal and he's probably out of his head now, I should say. <laughs> yeah, they've appointed a drug czar, along with the Alcopops Kaiser and the, <laughs> the joyriding sultan. Uh, I don't really understand why he has to be called a czar, presumably because he's woefully out of touch and he's bound to be overthrown at some point. <laughs> but they've got this, uh, sorry, this highly respected um, police officer from Yorkshire called Keith Hallowell to try and sort out drugs, and he's going to say, don't mess around with that stuff, kids, try this, it's the latest thing, it's called a frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be very good if he had a drug Rasputin to go with him. <laughs> evil bearded dwarf who carried his stash everywhere. It's <laughs> <laughs> no way to talk of the Foreign Secretary. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do get criticism over appearing on this kind of programme from time to time. But I think that, you know, in politics and in life generally, you're better just to be yourself. I enjoy it. I'm all for politicians being human beings, and I think that public like, generally is, is looking for a bit more of that. Since the increasingly relentless professionalising of political communications, the pages and sound bites and rapid rebuttal machines, humour is perhaps even more at a premium. 
it becomes urgent to knock these people off message. Maybe that's why, as the last century drew to a close, a big change occurred to the news quiz. The series brought in professional comedians to ginger up the attack. The old journalists-only rule was gradually loosened, and increasingly, bright young comedians with no roots in Fleet Street or Westminster were coming onto the programme, like Jeremy Hardy and Andy Hamilton. Oh, oh, I know. Have I written on my face with this biro? <laughs> no, that's just your face. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy knows this. What is it? Uh, no, I'm just saying for the listeners that Andy has a full head of raven black hair <laughs> and tousled curls over his manly frame and Basque and Jodhpurs. Um, yeah, Andrew, um, Andrew, that's Basque meaning separatist. Um, Andrew Motion has written a poem for the Trade Union Conference, which is, I miss the old TU, it would have been great if it was, it won't be, it, it will just fit in now with your modern trade unionism. In the old days, it would have been, they'd have had to introduce them saying, now, brothers and sisters, uh, we have a bit of something a little bit different for conference this year, and uh, <laughs> he's a little bit nervous. I want to give, give him a lot of support, and uh, it's uh, it's actually some poetry, brothers and sisters. <laughs> and I know, I know what you're thinking, and believe me, I've read it, and it's not Shelley, I'm telling you. But he's <laughs> he's come a long way, and he's a young lad, and he's very keen, and he's giving up his time for nothing. So please give a big hand to Andy Motion. <laughs> Charles Kennedy's advice could be offered to journalists too. Many on the news quiz do understand that the laughs along the way, not the winning, are what counts. But not all. Jeremy Hardy. Yeah, I think people panic, and they and sometimes they get they they they, they misunderstand that simply knowing what story it is isn't very interesting. So some journalists will come on and say, "Oh yes, now yes, now this will be the uh, this will be the story about um yes uh, that Gordon Brown is expected to um." Uh, to make an announcement about uh, about working families tax credit tomorrow, um, I think that's the that's the story, and they're all pleased. And you think, oh no, you don't get this at all. People are listening to this. It's not a job interview. Well, in my day, it was quite a different program. So it it was journalists were on the program all the time, and therefore there wasn't the same sort of heightened. Uh, there wasn't the star quality that there is now. I mean, now some of the participants go into bravura performances of their own uh, and immensely funny. Andy, where does mensana not lead to a corpora sano? Oh, great, I'll get a question in bloody Latin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think I know this. <laughs> <laughs> I know about this because it's about mensa. Hmm. And I was thrown out of mensa for making them feel inadequate later. <laughs> Basically, it was filling with hoi polloi, and uh, a woman called Julie Baxter is forming a breakaway group of Mensa. I don't quite know what she, what's she going to call it. Do we know? Immensa. <laughs> what does that Latin translate as, then? Mensana and corpora sana means a healthy mind and a healthy body. Oh, doesn't it? doesn't mean well, anorax with no friends, then. <laughs> <laughs> Comedians like Linda Smith, Jeremy Hardy, Andy Hamilton took the programme in new directions. And it's a progress that's been continued by the present producer, Lucy Armitage. Jeremy was a hugely successful addition to the team, and still is. I mean, he's a fantastic part of the team, and Linda was too when she joined in. And inevitably, when you start getting a sense of how much funnier it can be when people are actually actively, well, can't help themselves, just make a very good joke out of a very familiar story, it makes the show have an extra buzz to it. But at the same time, you do need to have a very thorough understanding of the stories. And without that, the show loses its attack, I think. So we try and keep the balance. And it's best when the show has a really good balance of journalism and comedy. Well, when I first started doing the news, because it's funny how it happened, really, because I, I wasn't meant to be a panellist. I was just a, a, a between-stairs maid at the BBC. Linda Smith. And I'd just come in to the studio just to sort of blacklead the great and bring fresh laudanum for the panellists and uh, I think how it came about was a bet between Alan Corran and Francis Ween who had, as you probably know Francis Ween is uh, he's 17th in line to the throne of England um, and they had a bet between them a sort of Pygmalion style bet when Alan said I'll bet you Ween that I could have this this little scullery maid making light hearted comments about the news like a duchess and uh, that's how it happened that's how I got to be on it of course I say Alan Corran it wasn't the Alan Corrin we've got now, there have been several Alans over the years, obviously, because 
well, he'd be about 500 or something. In the old days, I hate that phrase, but in the old days, there were many more. The proportion of women journalists to male journalists was fine. And we had journalists on the news quiz, and some weeks we would have two blokes and two women, you know, Gillian Reynolds and, and, and uh, Catherine Whitehall. You know, two different voices, one liver puddly and one... Great. Now, there aren't as many female comedians. And because the production team looks more for comedians, it's harder. You can find the blokes, the Fred McCauley's and Steve Punt and Jeremy Hardy and Andy Hamilton, all these guys who, come, who are very good. There aren't that many women... Uh, Sandy Toxfig is wonderful. Sandy Toxfig fulfills all the requirements of then and all the requirements of now. Sandy, how might a shortage on top be on the gender agenda? Oh, blimey. How might a shortage... What how might a shortage on top be on the gender oh, agenda? Oh, 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 it's... it's uh, I hate to say this to you next to Alan. It's bald men, isn't it? Yes. Yes, shame, really. Sorry. Um, <laughs> They're just flesh-coloured highlights. Um, That's it. <laughs> There aren't many like that. Linda's good. She's very funny and got a strong voice. But others that we've tried, I think Joe Brand has done one or two and you know, quite good. But there aren't that many. It's not a very big catchment. No, both the news quiz on radio and Have I Got News For You are dominated by boys showing off. Um, but I think that is um, in the nature of it. You invite um, men onto the show and they think, yeah, I could do that. I'll do it. You invite women on the show and they think, oh, no, I couldn't do that. Um, and that's, that's why you get that imbalance. And, and as it happens, lots of the men can't do it. These days, you've got to be incredibly fast. If you a joke comes into your head as a, a chairman or as a panellist, um, you think, now let me see if I say that. I could. And in the one or two seconds it takes you to think of that, you'll find that one of the comedians, Andy Hamilton or Jeremy Hardy or Alan Corrin, who's just as quick as any of them, or Linda Smith, will have come up with a joke on the same lines, but much better than you would have done, and much, much quicker. I've been spinning it out tonight just in the hopes that there'll be enough humorous material to keep the show going for half an hour, and I think we're almost there, so I really wouldn't worry about that. Get her in her pink blouse. <laughs> the participants these days, the brilliant Alan Corrin apart, are professional entertainers who come on and do a brilliant turn. I couldn't compete with um, Linda Smith and Jeremy Hardy. I've got enough sense to know that, and I hope I've got enough sense not to try. Jeremy, who thinks couch potatoes might be genetically modified? I don't know, John Humphreys? No, no it's, 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 it's a survey. It's always a survey. Is it? Yes, if you're lazy, or oh, if you're anything these days, yeah. it's down to your genes. I mean, there is no crime. You can be genetically predisposed to doing crap radio... <laughs> God knows, that's true. You just can't stop it. You walking down <laughs> Portland Place and find yourself being dragged into the BBC by your genes. <laughs> but there's a lazy gene. Is there? And it sticks you in the corner of the couch and switches on the Teletubbies and that's it. Is that the answer? Yes. Two points to us, then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got, the, got the gene, then, haven't you? Apparently. <laughs> Pass me my water, will you? <laughs> When you pass your own <laughs> you couldn't just get any comedian. We've tried one or two, and they if you don't have that interest in the news, if you don't follow the papers, because people sometimes say, well, you know, you've got someone like Jeremy Hardy's very left-wing. Well, he is very left-wing, but because he's very left-wing, he really reads the papers. He has views on these things. Uh, he's not just uh, waking up at noon and, you know, doing a... a jokey set about what it's like riding a bike or, um, you know, having sex with your girlfriend. He's actually read the papers and had opinions on them. And that's what gives the show an edge that uh, your average stand-up will probably never get. Linda, which torch might disappear into the deep mauve yonder? This is William Haig, isn't it? Was it 36, isn't he? It's never 36 human years, is it, really? <laughs> <laughs> sort of... Dorian Gray in reverse, you feel there's a painting in his attic where he looks really lovely. Um, <laughs> he's decided, uh, William Haig, that things aren't going very well for the Tory party. Something's wrong. Now, what is it? Can't be the policies, because the Labour Party have got them and they're doing ever so well. With them. 
So it's not the policy, so it must be that pesky logo. So they've got to get rid of the torch and they've got to change the colour to a different blue or maybe mauve. Um, all a bit weird, really, because apparently he's colour blind. <laughs> uh, which would explain his appearance at the Notting Hill Carnival. <laughs> uh, I think the only thing you can achieve with satire is to make people laugh. Linda Smith recently voted Britain's funniest person by Radio 4 listeners. I think Peter Cook summed up the effect of, of, of satire, really, when he set up the Establishment Club and uh, he was asked, did he, he think it would change society? And he said he expected it to be as effective as cabaret in the Weimar Republic was at halting the rise of Hitler. So I don't think you can get grandiose ideas of what satire can do to change the world. But what it does do is I think people who have perhaps thought a thing that you, you say in the form of a joke, when they hear it, someone else doing it and in that way, I think it cheers them up and makes them think, oh, it's not just me then. Other people think that. And I think that's a very valuable thing. It's a little tonic for the troops, really, because they don't feel isolated, like it's just them. The irony, as I see it, is that satire, whatever that overused and irretrievably blunted word means, offends more reliably than it reforms. <laughs> I remember in the old days, uh, before you were allowed to do satire, you had to do four years of satire in the provinces. <laughs> Learn what a joke was, and uh, now these people, Ben Elton, these people come up and they do satire straight away, and they shouldn't be allowed for anything. <laughs> Four years, you had to be born in Nigeria, you had to go to a prep school, and you had to go to college, and then you did your satire. But now anyone could do it, it's a disgrace, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, there are new apprentices out there ready to carry on the work. Ian Hislop. Well, there, I mean, there is a very long tradition of satirical and political humour in this country. I mean, there's sort of 400 years' worth of it, and people being involved on both sides of it, both commentating and participating. I mean, I think it's something we do well in this country, and something people are prepared to accept. The news quiz can go on for 25 years, and no-one is going to close it down. The BBC is not going to be forced to take it off the air for making jokes that politicians don't like, because that's one of the things we do here. I watched Tony Blair's speech this week, and I thought... I've really tried over the years not to be a, a cynical person. And, you know, <laughs> seriously, I have. I try to be patriotic. I try. I tried not to cheer when Juventus scored against Man United. And, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I watched Tony Blair, and suddenly the scales fell from my eyes, and I thought, he's right. He's right. So I'm going to answer this question in the way I feel he would want it answered, and say that this answer is not just for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want my children to grow up in a nation without answers. <laughs> look, people often ask me, why do I say look in an apparently spontaneous way when it's up on autocue? <laughs> Henry Kissinger said that satire died once Ronald Reagan became president. Over the last 25 years, politics has become less revered. The monarchy is seen as something of a soap opera and the media has become more intrusive. Spitting image helped, though its brutality has made life harder for those who seek any kind of elegance in their satire. John Lloyd, the founding producer of both the News Quiz and Spitting Image. I don't envy young satirists now, because what can you say that hasn't been said? You're driven into a kind of uh, a blind alley where, in order to get people's attention, you have to be extremely rude and extremely nasty and shocking. And it's a bleaker world than it was 25 years ago. In, in the 70s, you know, we worried dimly, I suppose, about the prospect of a nuclear war, but we hadn't really worried about it for 10 or 15 years. But there was a sense that there were still statesmen in the world, people of, of great stature. Not every politician, in other words, was a, was a barking mad swine. And I've, of course, been, uh, to some extent, responsible for all that uh, slippage in in the reputation of politicians and the royal family and so on. Although, one has to say, poor loves, they do sort of ask for it a bit. And, you know, when one thinks of what the poor old royal family have been through, all the things that one used to make jokes about in Spitting Image, which were, you know, very small things, like Princess Margaret likes a gin and tonic, and seem, with the passage of time, extraordinarily tame already. The news quiz's work was easier when that was where listeners might first hear gossip or rudeness which wouldn't be in the papers. These days, the bones of a joke have often been picked clean already in the regular press. Alan Corrin has been with the programme throughout. 25 years ago, 
people's private lives were not nearly as public. So there was much more innuendo about who Princess Margaret might or might not have been seeing, and we could do jokes about that. Now, everybody knows everything. So the sort of gossipy things we used to do on the news quiz, we, we certainly can't do that. I mean, that's disappeared from, from, from newspapers. What else has gone from then? In order to compete with radio and television, newspapers are now magazines, so there's much more stuff in newspapers, which is already funny. So when you come to do the news quiz, you go through the papers. By about page four, uh, you've got the jokey stuff, uh, or you've just got big feature pieces by Linda Lee Potter or Stephen Glover or Richard Littlejohn, whoever it is, waspish columnists, uh, lots of wags. And that didn't happen 25 years ago. We, We could do our own waggery. It's harder now. But like a bunch of old and trusted friends, there's still something the news quiz can do which newspapers can't. Simon Hoggart again. One of the most important days for us, I think, was approximately two weeks and a bit after September 11th last year. We were due to start the series on September the 19th. They cancelled, not surprisingly. We gathered to do a recording on September the 26th, and everyone was in very, very gloomy and tense mood. And if you remember those days, we really didn't know whether war was going to engulf the earth or what the next terrorist strike was going to be. And um, we gathered in the rehearsal room with a glass of wine and a sandwich waiting to go on, and people were worried about what was the response of the audience going to be? What was their own response going to be? Could anyone think of any jokes? Was it appropriate to come up with any jokes? Bizarrely, we had the one of the funniest shows we've ever done, and I think it was that sense of release. Suddenly... After all this time, people felt that they could actually laugh at what was going on around, not trivialise it, but find a degree of humour, at least in some of the aspects to it, which I I think, you know, there was almost a great shout of pleasure from the audience at that particular show, and I think that taught me a lot about the the nature of the news quiz. When we were kids, our mums, dads and despairing school teachers used to say to us, it isn't clever and it isn't funny. For 25 years, the news quiz has rooted its appeal on the suspicion that it absolutely is. I have to say, I think there's something very English, and I do mean English, about it all. Little demonstrates this more regularly than one of the programme's enduring strengths. Sheer silliness. The trivial foibles, gaffes and slips humans make. Those little nibs... The sidebars, the small ads, the provincial papers' howlers sent in by a loyal band of listeners that tell us something about how our world turns. Nine people were bitten by donkeys on Bridlington Sands during last season. 172 were stung by jellyfish and another 13 were bitten by dogs. These were just a few of the 2,186 cases handled by first aid posts on the town beaches. Only one casualty required hospital treatment, a male tourist from Holland who had to have a stick of rock removed. (laughs) Yeah, a sort of sense of anarchy, really, a sense of uh, fun in in the sort of absurdities of ordered life, really. Yeah, I think it does have that quite anarchic edge to it really there's there's something about it that appeals to us the idea that maybe you know we might have sensible jobs and and you know mortgages and all the rest of it but there's still a part of us that can see how ridiculous all that is so many pairs of black marks and spencer's underwear have been ripped from under the nurse's uniform at the thackeray medical museum that chiefs have had to remove her knickers permanently and install closed circuit television cameras It's not about celebrity. It was about this is the way the world operates, and it's crazy. It's you know, it's it's insane. Um, Long, long after I stopped producing it, I remember listening to one uh, uh, one episode of the news quiz in the car, and I had to stop the car. I was laughing so much because one of the cuttings they read out was about a cleaner in an office block had been sacked because he'd cleaned the same lift eighteen times, thinking it was a different lift on each floor. You know, and that says, uh, I don't know, it says so much about life, doesn't it? This guy goes, oh, there's another lift here, you know. <laughs> he'd gone up, he'd walked up each floor, pressed the button, cleaned the lift, you know, shut the door, <laughs> walked up the next floor. That There's a world, there's a whole world compacted in there into this this little atom of information. 
is you see the man, don't you? It has to be a man, I don't know why. You know, perhaps not long off the boat, you know, with his bucket and his mop, and the, you see him trudging up, you know, the, the, the echoey staircase and pressing the new aluminium lift, and you can tell a whole story, but he wrote a play about it. And it's, it's about that, those moments of laughter and insanity that in some strange way draw us together, you know, the sense of the human race being on a giant sort of lifeboat in this sort of crazy tempest of events. England is, is, is very, this Alice in Wonderland place that has all this dottiness. And the same is true of the little bits of life of England, the parish magazines, the local newspapers. It says, Mr Garcia told the San Mateo Divorce Court that he'd first become suspicious about his wife last August when their parrot, Rocky, suddenly took to screaming, Oh, Charlie! Yes, Charlie! Oh, Charlie! <laughs> the audience is ahead of me. Mr Garcia's name is Anthony. <laughs> it's a sort of safety valve. I think it does perform that function, is that you, by laughing at the hideous nature of events, you, um, you say, oh, yeah, well, it's not so bad. You know, I can go on for another week. Weight Watchers will meet at 7 p.m. Please use large double doors at the side entrance. <laughs> this is sent in by Simon Hoth from the Stevenage Comet. It's a little advert. It says, for sale, cheap electric guitar and powerful amplifier. Phone after 6 p.m. If boy answers, please ring off and call later. <laughs> A Lincolnshire police newspaper reports that a Skegness inspector asked an injured youth, where are you bleeding from, lad? The boy replied, from Chesterfield. 